but we also have with us Anise Jenkins of, of uh, Free DC, as well as James Wright, reporter for the Washington Informer, uh, displaying his Alpha Phi Alpha uh, shirt today. Is maybe it's a special day. <laughs> it's what, good to have you both on on the show. Um, Anise, I'll, I'm going to start with you first, and just tell me um, well, how long have you been involved in this in in this fight for statehood for DC, and, and what got you involved? I have been involved since our organization was founded in 1997. And in 1997, that's the year, just it was two years before the uh, what was called the Financial Control Board was created. And it was created by Congress and the President of the United States to take over all um, local government run by Washington, D.C. All they left us was parks and recreation. That's the only things we had control over at, in D.C. And I was totally shocked. Didn't know the Congress had that kind of power over us. And I looked for somewhere to protest. And I said, I cannot believe this is happening. And I read that there were was an organization. I don't even think we had a name at that time. But we met in the basement of Rainbow Push Coalition, in, which was in Georgetown at that time. And we decided we were going to protest at the White House because the president had endorsed the control board. And we got on the fence of the um, White House and we got arrested. That was my first action in the statehood movement. And we were very clear that why we were there was because there was such a thing as a control board that could take over our local government. And we said, no, we're not going to take this. We're going to protest and get out there and call attention to this, to the country. Had you been much of an activist before that? And what was, I mean, I, I certainly understand why you picked up uh, this as a um, issue to, to fight against. But before that, you know, what was Anise Jenkins doing? I in political science at Howard University, which is where our vice president, Kamala Harris, graduated from. I studied political science very closely, but it was very odd. I would have to say they didn't do, do a lot of inside teaching on the government, the local government of Washington, D.C., or our relationship with the Congress, the fact that the Congress could control DC, the fact that we didn't have representation in the House or the Senate. I would say I have all be, always been obsessed with politics. I followed, when I was a child on TV, I followed every action that Martin Luther King did. I followed every action that the civil rights workers were performing. I followed every convention. Here I am, a child of probably 10 years old, watching the conventions on television. But I was always obsessed with uh, government and how the government could uh, have control over DC. James, I'm gonna, st thank you. I, I wanna start with you too, because I know you've been covering this issue for some time, but you are also a transplant. Uh, and for someone who came to DC from Austin, Texas, you may have gone some other places before you got here, but you're like a lot of Washingtonians, except you came and now you're covering uh, the statehood struggle. But what was it like for you when you realized uh, the state or the non-state of the District of Columbia? Can you As unmute your, okay. Go right ahead. Go right okay. Ahead. What really opened my eyes is the fact that you have taxation without representation uh, in a country which was founded uh, based on the principle of that uh, King George III could impose his will and the colonists couldn't respond, uh, but they paid taxes for it, uh, was ridiculous. And then you have this in our nation's capital, uh, the capital of the free world. And then you have this taking place. This was ridiculous. And then, as you alluded to, I came from Texas, where uh, and you can dawdle with history. But the fact is, is uh, Texans fought for their freedom 
uh, in in terms of of a, of a repressive Mexico. Now, there's retro history in that, but the point is, is that you must have, uh, you can't have taxation without representation. That's ridiculous. It's unfair. And it's unfair that district residents have to pay billions of dollars to a federal government that does not give them full representation in the House and no representation in the Senate, even though they can be drafted into war. And as Denise kind of alluded to, no other jurisdiction in the country, not even the territories, has the kind, that type of arrangement. Well, I can tell you are not the unbiased journalist covering this story. <laughs> and we asked you because we were we are asking about your opinion, but you've also covered the story. Mm -hmm. And this has been a long struggle. I mean, um, Anise says she's been involved since 1994, I believe she said. Um, 97. 97, 1997. I mean, we're almost looking at 30 years. Yes. Um, what, James, in covering this, what have you, what has been your observation? One, either about the interest in DC residents in the movement. Is it, has it grown uh, in popular, not popularity, but, um, you know, in, in support, I'll put it that way, uh, over the years, because it seems as though uh, there have been some, you know, ebbs and flows. And this is a big moment right now. That's a good point, Denise. Uh, even though district residents are adversely affected by the fact that they have no representation, one of the things that has shocked me when I came here to D.C. in 1987 is that a lot of D.C. residents were nonchalant about this. Uh, it's sort of like uh, Edward Kennedy once said that uh, D.C. is not going to become a state until it rises to the level of an insult. And I'm sure Anise agrees with me, even though we have substantially more people interested in statehood now, to some residents, it's still not an insult. I'll quote Julius Hobson, uh, home fool. Uh, many people are comfortable, and I'll never understand it, they're comfortable with this home rule setup, uh, which, uh, as you know, Denise, the Congress can overrule, if they wish, any action in terms of the budget and the legislation. Again, no other jurisdiction in the country, not even the territories, uh, can Congress do that to. So that's the thing about it. But it has grown over the years. And I think a lot of it is because of uh, Congresswoman Norton's seniority. As she has grown in seniority, she's, in, she's now in place, like uh, on Monday, to have a hearing early in the legislative session uh, on statehood. That could not have occurred uh, many years before. I want to bring Anise back in before we have to close, but uh, I, I, you can respond to uh, what James has said with regards to what your observations have been in the movement and also what you anticipate or expect. The battle is not on Monday. The battle is after you get through Monday to get to the Senate. So That's right. uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Yes, we're headed to the Senate. I, we have no doubt that I, I don't know if we should be so confident because I don't think things will change, but the Democrats do control the House of Representatives. Um, we will get through the, the vote in the House, this, uh, the hearing in the House of Representatives. People need to learn. I think it's very important that people need to know it comes from education. I never understood why people weren't angry enough. I, I was motivated by anger. I was motivated by the feeling of insult, which James was talking about. We are the only country in the world that's the, that does not allow its the residents of its capital visitation in, the, uh, federal, in their federal government. We are the only country in the world that does this. And why does this exist? I think it's because DC was uh, located where the, um, the um, uh, South wanted DC to be located. It was located here because it allowed slavery. Well, I consider the lack of um, our rights as political slavery. People need to really be angry and see that they are paying their taxes for what they don't get. They need to be angry about it. So the last hearing, uh, there were hundreds of DC residents that went to Capitol Hill. This time because yes. of um, the insurrection and, and other things, uh, you will not 
uh, residents will not be able to go to the hearing, so they'll have to watch it virtually. But uh, what kind of organizing, you know, briefly, if you could just share, what kind of organizing are you all doing around Monday? And then what happens after that? Yes, we plan to be at Freedom Plaza Monday at 9 a.m. The hearing starts at 11. We will, um, we and some other groups will meet at Freedom Plaza at 9 a.m. to hold our free de- to hold our statehood statehood now signs, and you can get those signs at 202-641-4680. You can call that number and ask for the statehood now signs. Can you give that one more time, Anise? Yes, it's 202-641-4680. And what I'm doing is giving the number of another organization, which is Statehood Neighbors for United for DC Statehood. I think it's very important that we be there with our signs and just on that's on Pennsylvania Avenue where the uh, Freedom Plaza is located right across from the Wilson building. And I must expose James to uh, reveal that his uh, fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha, endorsed DC statehood. That is one of the largest, I believe, fraternities in the country. And they have really helped us to educate the public. I have to thank him so much for his coverage. And uh, um, the endorsement of Alpha Phi Alpha, which was Martin Luther King's fraternity. Mm -hmm. That's right. I want to thank both of you all for, I mean, just this brief moment, getting folks ready and riled up for Monday. We'll be out there, of course, covering it as well. Uh, And uh, Anise, keep fighting. Thank you so much. James, keep writing, keep writing, keep fighting. (laughs) Glad to have you all both on the show. I appreciate it. Uh, 